Welcome everyone to today's webinar from the Clean Energy States Alliance. We're going to begin in just a moment. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar topic is FERC 841 Compliance Update and this webinar is being presented by the Clean Energy States Alliance as part of the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, STAP. Um, we have some excellent guest speakers with us today. Um, before I get started with them and our uh, moderator Todd Alinsky paul let me just go over a few quick housekeeping slides with you. So today all of our participants on the webinar are in listen only mode, so you will not be able to, um, we will not be able to hear you. You can join the audio portion of the webinar either using the mic and speakers and VoIP on your computer or you can choose to dial in with your telephone. If the webinar console is interfering with your ability to see the slides, there's an orange um, button here with a white arrow. If you click on that, it will move the webinar console off to your right. If you'd like it to come back, you can uh, click on the orange button again and it will also expand the console back again. Um, today we're going to ask that all of you submit questions that you may have using this question box. Please type in your questions as they occur to you. Um, you can do this during the presentation. Do not wait to the end. Uh, once you've uh, finish typing, you can hit send and then our moderator will be collecting your questions and we'll get through as many as he can in the last 10 or 15 minutes uh, following today's presentations. This webinar is being recorded and it will be um, posted on the Clean Energy States Alliance website. We also will be emailing you a notice within 48 hours um, with a link to where the webinar recording is posted and the uh, webinar materials are available. Again, all of this will be um, up on the CISA website and the URL is noted here. With that, I'm going to pass you all off to our host and moderator today, Todd Alinsky-Paul. Todd is the project director at the Clean Energy States Alliance and so Todd, why don't you go ahead? Okay, thanks very much Maria and welcome everybody to today's webinar. I will do a brief introduction of our program and speakers and then we will go right into the main presentation and following that we will answer as many questions as we have time to get to. So uh, for those who may not be familiar, Clean Energy States Alliance is a nonprofit. We're located in Vermont. We work with uh, state clean energy funds from states all over the country. You can see on the screen the logos of our members. And basically, we, we help these state clean energy agencies to run their programs better, to learn about new technologies, and to uh, share information, uh, and also to work with other entities, such as the federal government and national labs. In this case, uh, this webinar is part of a series of webinars that we do through our STEP program. Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, which we conduct under uh, contract with Sandia National Laboratories. It's funded by DOE Office of Electricity, and we thank them very much for their support. Uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, STAP itself has worked and is working with quite a number of states on energy storage. Some of the uh, projects represented here are actual energy storage deployments, others are uh, state policy development efforts. Uh, so STEP does a number of things. Uh, in this case, um, this webinar is part of our effort to disseminate information on energy storage to stakeholders. And we do many of these webinars, they are all recorded and archived on our website. So if you want to review it, send a link to a friend or you missed part of it or, or something of that nature, you can always go back and watch it again. Uh, the slides are also available after the webinar. Uh, in addition to the webinars, we also um, occasionally 
publish reports, we uh, speak at conferences and so forth. And then in addition to this information dissemination, we work to put together uh, energy storage deployment projects that are jointly supported by state or municipal agencies, USDOE Office of Electricity, and Sandia National Laboratories. We also support state energy storage policy and program development and regulatory development, and um, and that's mostly what we do. So if you could advance the slide, please, Maria, I will introduce our speakers for today. Um, not in order in which they appear. We will first hear from Jason Berwin, who is Vice President of Policy at the Energy Storage Association. He leads the ESA's U.S. Storage Industry uh, Federal RTO and State Policy Engagement and has done so since 2015. Previously, he was the Associate Director for Energy Innovation at the Bipartisan Policy Center, where he directed research and advocacy on U.S. energy R&D and tax policy. He also serves as staff director of the American Energy Innovation Council as a consultant to utilities on demand response program design at FSC Group slash Nexent and as a reviewer of utility renewable energy procurement contracting for the California Public Utilities Commission. Jason holds master's degrees from the University of California, Berkeley's Energy and Resource Group and Goldman School of Public Policy, as well as a bachelor's degree from Columbia University. We will then hear from Dan Finn Foley, the head of the energy storage team at Wood McKenzie Power and Renewables, formerly GTM Research, where uh, Dan focuses on front of the meter energy storage applications. He re previously worked as a senior consultant with DNVGL, where he focused on competitive energy markets and the intersection of emerging energy business strategies within the broader evolving technological and regulatory environment. Prior to DNVGL, he worked with Navigant Consulting and the Department of Energy. Uh, Dan holds a Master's of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering degree from the University of Massachusetts Amherst Wind Energy Center and a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics Physics from Brown University. Before we hear from Jason, I just want to remind everyone um, that uh, today's uh, webinar is um, quite well attended. Um, we have, let's see, 236 attendees at this point and more logging on. So uh, please don't wait until the very end to type in your question. If you, if there's something that you think of during the presentations, go ahead and type it into the question console so that I can be sorting through those while the presentations are ongoing and we can get to as many as we can at the end. Um, again, this is being recorded and will be posted on our website. And with no further ado, I will now turn this over to Jason Berwin. Thanks, Todd. Can you hear me all right? Yep, just fine. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And hello, everyone. Uh, pleased to be with you all. Uh, for those of you who have not heard of the Energy Storage Association, uh, ESA is the National Trade Association here in the United States representing all parts of the energy storage industry. So in addition to manufacturers and component suppliers, we have the folks who are integrating storage and all other components into actual products and systems, developers who are creating those projects, the independent generators, the electric utilities, the large end users who are actually using energy storage systems, as well as, of course, the law and finance folks all around it. And while our members are focused primarily at this point on battery storage, we do represent folks also working on thermal storage, mechanical storage, power to gas storage technologies. Um, for my remarks today, that bear in mind that we do mean uh, the wide variety of storage technologies, but uh, in talking about Order 841 and wholesale markets, we're going to be focused on electric storage. That is, electrons in, electrons out. That's going to be the focus of the discussion here and how Order 841 conceives of storage. So I'll give a brief overview uh, for those of you who might be coming more fresh to what FERC Order 841 is before diving into the compliance activities, complaints from ESA and others regarding that compliance, and certainly um, what we see actually coming out of Order 841 a little bit in terms of further regulatory uh, and market rules 
developments. Um, so first, just to launch right into this, you know, Order 841 is focused on removing barriers to the participation of storage in organized wholesale electricity markets. Um, really, this is driven by the importance of enhancing competition. The basic understanding being that more resources in providing more competition ensures just and reasonable rates for wholesale electric service. Uh, it was also important to note that FERC in its rationale for Order 841 identified the importance of adding storage to the system for assisting in resilience as well. But really the focus here is on making sure that we're removing barriers and increasing competition. And so, uh, you know, just to give folks a little bit of background here, ultimately uh, what we see the so what of Order 841 doing is clarifying and regularizing really storage participation in wholesale markets for energy ancillary services and capacity. It's really about making this a standard part of doing business on the grid. And I think in the longer run, it's really important for laying the foundation for greater flexibility more broadly in wholesale market operations. And we can talk a little bit later on about exactly how we see implementation of Order 841 as leading to that. In terms of a status check, just in terms of where things are right now, FERC Order 841 compliance activities are underway. There are complaints by ESA and other parties that are pending adjudication at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, ultimately, Order 841 has an effective compliance date intended to be December 3rd of this year. Uh, given that FERC has still yet to adjudicate those complaints, and we are now in October of 2019, the delays requested by several of the RTOs and ISOs, uh, it would not surprise me if those requests for delayed implementation are granted. Uh, and I should just note that PJM and ISO New England have been implementing manuals changes. ISO New England is actually going a little faster just because they actually had a sort of energy storage, uh, what they called enhanced storage participation uh, project already on the books when Order 841 was issued. So they were already working on a lot of this and have been working on those manuals changes. PJM has been working diligently on manuals changes across manual 15, 18, 11, 27, 28, 29, 36, 40, 14 D and 36. Uh, I know that might be a gobbledygook, but I'm just trying to give folks a sense for all of the different parts of uh, how Order 841 touches the way that manuals, which really sort of help codify in non-FERC tariff language, how market rules should be interpreted and how processes run to ensure the normal uh, inclusion of energy storage in energy ancillary services and capacity markets. I also note that the uh, pending, uh, the lack of adjudication is starting to lead, at least we're aware that PJM is now starting to consider contingency plans because it does not, of course, have a desire to move forward without being sure that it is its compliance plan is in fact going to be uh, accepted or not. So that is still something to stay tuned on. Uh, one other piece of very important uh, context for folks to be aware of here is that there were uh, a number of rehearing requests on Order 841. And uh, earlier this year, FERC reaffirmed, uh, for the most part, Order 841 against those rehearing requests. It denied rehearing on most areas. Uh, and so the many of the parties who brought some of those rehearing requests, such as NARUC, and others like APPA, NRECA, and EEI have now moved a petition over to the DC Circuit asking for review of Order 841 uh, as a potential violation of the Federal Power Act. Again, something we can get into a little bit later, but this really concerns uh, how Order 841 is intended to apply to storage at all points on the electric system, whether that's transmission connected, distribution connected, or sited behind a customer meter. Uh, and, and again, happy to have a conversation about that if folks would like. However, I know that folks are really interested in understanding implementation 
So we'll dive into that. Um, one thing to bear in mind here about what Order 841 does and does not do, this is about removing barriers to storage by requiring the RTOs and ISOs to implement a participation model. So, and these are just the headline directives. Uh, ultimately, I think there's something like over 70 distinct directives to the RTOs and ISOs regarding 841 compliance and implementation. But at a high level, this is what it's about. It's providing all market services that storage is technically capable of providing. So that's a lot of updating tariff language. Implementing bidding parameters or other means to reflect physical and operational characteristics of storage. That's particularly significant because uh, first, energy storage has this thing called a state of charge where you're managing the limited amount of energy in the product, or sorry, in the resource. Uh, and so the way in which you do that requires sort of a new set of characteristics that other resources may not have. Secondarily, to recognize that storage is uh, nearly instantaneously flexible, if you're talking about, say, lithium-ion batteries. And third, to recognize that it is also energy limited, that you only have so much before you go to a zero charge. So, uh, and that it is bidirectional. These are all things that make this different than other resources. And this is taking actually, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the thinking through in terms of software updates for uh, including energy storage in uh, economic dispatch and unit commitment engines. Uh, enabling storage projects as small as 100 kilowatts to participate including uh, DER storage. So that is, again, computationally something that I think uh, different RTOs and ISOs are, are taking on with greater or lesser enthusiasm, and then just regularizing the buying and selling of energy at wholesale. Order 841 does not create or modify market products. It does not amend interconnection, transmission planning, or other RTO functions. It does not require any larger changes to commitment optimization, scheduling, and dispatch. This is really about removing barriers, updating tariffs. Uh, and I think that what I have found coming out of these conversations on compliance and implementation is that certainly we see conversations spinning up on a number of these subjects, but even though they are spinning up on them, Order 841 does not require any action on them. Okay. Moving on to the actual compliance plans themselves, it would take me an enormous amount of time and, and, and probably put folks to sleep to try and summarize all of what is in the compliance plans. I think it's actually more interesting to note what are the issues that are being uh, brought up as potentially of controversy in the various compliance plans of the RTOs and ISOs on Order 841. And so I've highlighted a few different issues that we have brought up in those compliance plans, as well as some cross-cutting issues and, frankly, some perspective issues coming out of Order 841 compliance as well. So I'll just kind of go through these fairly quickly since I want to, I realize, leave some time uh, for Q&A here. So Todd and folks, I will speed up here. PJM. Um, one of the key issues here is on the duration of storage for qualification in its capacity markets. They're requiring 10 hour duration for the qualification. We'll get into that in a bit. In MISO, uh, we had an issue with the application of transmission fees to storage that might be charging at ISO instruction, such as for economic dispatch. Uh, that has now been actually resolved in the rehearing order where FERC made clear that they intended uh, exemption of transmission fees to storage for defined market services in their uh, in the tariff. So something like an ancillary service, uh, it would seem that economic energy market dispatch does not necessarily count, but it leaves open that RTOs and ISOs could define other market products that would then uh, allow for the exemption of transmission fees to storage. In ISO New England, the major objection there was to the redeclaration process, this is a, basically, it would limit how much you could empty your energy storage unit uh, because of the need to retain some amount of reserves. So in automatically changing the sort of limits to the output of that storage over time, this is now actually being addressed in stakeholder committee. And I give a lot of credit to the ISO New England and Neepool folks for uh, taking this issue seriously and making sure that energy storage can operate as fully as possible in its markets. Uh, in New York ISO, we saw 
Um, a bias against self-management of state of charge and a lack of make whole payments for storage when that storage is participating in capacity markets. Uh, we also saw that there were modifications of market mitigation rules. This is now actually, I would say, probably going to be dealt with in a separate docket as well at FERC, uh, 206 brought by New York State on market mitigation rules associated with storage. Some other cross-cutting issues uh, outside of just these individual RTO ISO issues, the uh, lack of uh, or inappropriate utilization of commitment parameters, um, which we've seen in PGM ISO and in the New York ISO, as well as uh, barriers to the dual participation of DER storage that have been brought up in MISO. Uh, I should note that New York ISO, a lot of that is now being resolved through the tariff filing that New York ISO made on dispatchable DER. Uh, but suffice it to say, this is another issue that we'll get into in a little bit. And then some perspective issues. Lack of clarity for how these rules apply to hybrid storage plus generation resources. So the Order 841 is focused on storage by itself, but we are seeing more and more resources of energy storage paired with, say, solar or wind or other generation resources at the same point of interconnection as an integrated single unit. Uh, similarly, market mitigation rules are unclear, and that'll be an evolving part, I imagine, of uh, RTO market monitors functions as storage increases on these systems. Without getting too deep into each of these, I just want to touch on some of the highlight issues that I think Order 841 compliance and implementation is raising. One of these is the capacity value of storage question. As I noted, PJM proposing to qualify storage only for what it can do at 10 hours of duration. Uh, we see that as being inappropriate. Uh, that is based on a calculation of basically what a 20% penetration of storage, approximately 30 gigawatts would require. We see that as inappropriate and in fact commissioned our own study with the Strap A Consulting, finding that four gigawatts of four hour storage and 10 gigawatts of six hour storage would contribute full capacity value equivalent to other resources today. Um, we see that uh, that finding is mirroring some of the proposed changes in New York ISO to vary capacity value by duration and incremental deployment level. Um, and I just note for reference here that in MISO and SPP, uh, qualification of storage's contribution to resource adequacy is its four hour duration. In ISO New England, it's a two hour test and they have a performance market there. And I think one of the issues here we're worried about is that if FERC accepts PJM's approach, which they say is based in fact in manual language, um, those manuals will allow PJM to dial up or down storage participation without FERC review. Um, so this is going to be a remaining question. This hasn't really been something that's been necessarily thrown into tariffs previously because for the most part, the capacity value of resources has been kind of dealt with uh, for things that have different constraints in different manuals in different ways. And this is bringing up this issue that uniform quote unquote capacity value is obviously increasingly in tension with heterogeneous resources that have different relative capacity contributions because of different reliability contribution profiles. The obvious one for storage is it's limited energy. Generators, though, have forced outage conditions, um, some of those being tied to ambient uh, conditions that might have to do with heat or water availability. Renewables, obviously lacking dispatchability, have their own constraints, demand resources, at least in PJM are block loaded, so they have their own constraints. And, you know, one of the things that we try or we're trying to bring into this conversation is making sure that the actual qualification of storage for its capacity contribution matches what analytically you would find through doing the kind of reliability analysis that we've seen uh, in a number of other places. And so I've had findings from our ASTRAP-A Consulting Commission study in the upper left of this slide. Just for reference here, uh, on the right, you have a slide from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory that shows how that capacity, that uh, the capacity of storage that can provide full uh, reliability contribution, in fact, goes up as you increase wind and solar in that system. So it's also important to bear in mind that where you are today with today's grid mix does not necessarily reflect the capacity contribution in tomorrow's grid mix. And then in the bottom there, just a representation of New York ISO's tariff 
filing currently pending before the commission in terms of how they're looking at this. And I think it's important to just note that they're, you know, this is this is not an arithmetic scaling. There's still high value for shorter duration storage, and that they see this sort of evolving as the grid mix may evolve, which is sort of referenced here in these NREL studies. Another topic that I think is, of course, relevance that I mentioned is dual participation of DER storage. So that 100 kilowatt minimum size threshold being brought down obviously opens the door to a lot of single DER storage units. This is not about aggregations. That is a separate docket, so I'm not talking about anything other than single DER storage unit participation. Um, MISO proposed to limit and phase in very small storage participation. I should update this slide to note that FERC in its rehearing order said, nope, you must implement. There is not a phase in. You either do it or you don't do it effectively. Um, New York ISO has, is now again through its dispatchable DER tariff filing that is subsequent to its 841 compliance filing, rectifying that it uh, forces behind the meter storage to elect only wholesale or only retail energy. Um, although I think there are still some questions about limitations to DER storage participation in the New York ISO market. Suffice it to say, uh, you know, this is really the focus of issues over state and federal jurisdiction. We think that the Arkansas PSC's offering, which FERC ultimately, I think, took up in the rehearing order, is the right balance, which is that uh, there needs to be a pathway to market for DERs and states continue to retain an enormous amount of authority over exactly what those DER units are and are not allowed to are not allowed to do. Um, but I, you know, whatever the case, the importance of this is because a lot of folks are looking at distribution connected storage, either behind the meter or front of meter, to really provide multiple services. So not just bulk system services through an RTO and ISO, but also perhaps more local services to the distribution system or ultimately to an end user if it's behind the meter. The idea being that as you are able to do that and use the full flexibility of the storage, you can provide more services with the same amount of storage, which means that the ultimate uh, cost for providing those services can actually go down uh, if you're able to really maximize the utilization of that asset. So there's a lot of work right now about enabling multiple use storage, storage that is that is providing both say local distribution services and bulk system services in parallel uh, or serially. And there's some regulatory updates on the state side and some coordination with the RTOs and ISOs that I think is important to enable that uh, kind of multiple use functionality for storage. Um, there are also real challenges here for folks for, who are trying to account for wholesale versus retail transactions which Order 841 directed folks to try and do if they had a method for doing so. And California really has sort of led the way here on guidance regarding dual participation and that kind of accounting question. Um, New York has sort of followed suit there. I think there's still more regulatory development to be done at the state side on these topics. And uh, for we may f see more detail to come in that FERC docket on DER aggregation participation rulemaking 18-9, um, which uh, I don't think there's any imminent action on. We just saw a data request asking about wholesale DER interconnection issues in that docket, so stay tuned there. Um, as I noted, hybrid storage plus generation, uh, this is, I think, going to rapidly become very important because there are now over 50 gigawatts of these hybrid storage plus generation units in interconnection queues across the United States, how those hybrid resources interconnect, how they participate in markets, what their capacity valuation is, among many other issues, are really not clear. No RTO or ISO has systematically clarified how these assets are going to be treated. Cal ISO has recently started the first initiative amongst the RTOs and ISOs to try and come up with sort of a more holistic treatment for these. And certainly we see this as being very important uh, and we're seeking sort of follow-on work from FERC on this. We also just recently released a paper 
enabling versatility, allowing hybrid resources to deliver their full value to customers, which is available on ESA's website, that summarizes the main issues and some potential remedies here. And I think that there's a provocation in that paper, which is as we have more of these hybrid resources, there's a potential both challenge to the RTO and ISO regarding optimization, but also an opportunity insofar as asset managers may have a greater visibility and granularity of control to be able to optimize what those hybrid resources can offer to grid operators and the potential win-win in doing so. Uh, lastly, I'll just start uh, men make a mention here of Order 841 starting other conversations. As I noted, there are now folks thinking about different market products and designs to take advantage of storage's flexibility. We're seeing ERCOT now implementing the first U.S. market for fast frequency response. Um, this is a subject that has come up previously elsewhere, but ERCOT's moving first. We're seeing a discussion of sort of a proper load or supply shift product. This is different than arbitrage. Arbitrage is just about sending signals about when to buy energy and when to sell energy. This actually links the two transactions and considers it a use, a productive use of the consumed energy later on. So that's something that's being explored, I believe, in Cal ISO. And of course, folks talking about how energy price formation might be enhanced to provide greater signals for flexibility. From the interconnection side, obviously, we, uh, we're looking to see folks, or we're hearing a lot more discussion about study methods that account for the intended use of the storage asset that is not studying it as charging on peak. Uh, and Order 845, I might note as well, is leading to uh, more of these discussions about how storage will operate when hybridized with generation resources. Finally, storage is transmission. Order 841 was about wholesale generator markets, uh, but not about storage as a transmission asset. This is a conversation that's got spinning up recently inside of the FERC docket on transmission technologies. And we're seeing in the November 5th and 6th FERC technical workshop will include discussion on storage as transmission as well. So stay tuned on that. That's just, I think, to give folks an overview of some of the interesting issues coming out of Order 841, both within the compliance plans and implementation, as well as outside of them. There's obviously a range of other issues I didn't even get to, things like the parameterization of storage and how it interacts with software, issues like market mitigation approaches, which I made a reference to, topics associated with unit commitment and you know if folks want to talk about those i will save them for the q a but otherwise i uh, just want to note thank you to everyone who is able to uh, call in today and i'll be happy to take questions okay thanks very much jason and before we go to uh, our second presenter, I just want to ask you, we have several questions about ERCOT, which I think you mentioned once in that last uh, slide, but uh, maybe you could just say a, a few words. Uh, people are asking, is ERCOT um, covered, you know, responsible to FERC, to, or in, if not, and, and some folks are saying, you sure. know, that, that it isn't, um, is it doing sort of parallel activities or responding in some way to keep up with what's going on in the, in the FERC regulated areas? Absolutely. Happy to talk to it. So ERCOT is not a FERC jurisdictional market. It is entirely within the bounds of Texas. As some of you know, it is, it's in fact, its own grid. It is neither connected to the Western Interconnect nor the Eastern Connect. Interconnect, it is its own thing. Uh, and so it does not have to follow what FERC says with respect to these Order 841. That said, um, after several years of, I would say, no work or interest on storage, uh, over the last six months, we've seen a sudden, uh, quite strong uptick in interest at ERCOT on energy storage issues, I think folks there want to learn from Order 841, Order 845, and other actions different RTOs and ISOs have taken. And so uh, actually coming out of an April workshop, there's now seven different issues that are being assigned to different uh, subcommittees at ERCOT on ener updating rules for energy storage. And they're also now convening a battery energy storage task force, which has just been stood up, 
with its first meeting coming on October 18th. So I think uh, for those of you who are ERCOT watchers, this is going to be the sort of quote unquote 841 of Texas is coming. Great, thank you for that. We're going to now go uh, on to Dan Finn Foley and his presentation, and then we will get back to as many questions as we possibly can. Dan? Thank you so much, Todd. Thank you to Clean Energy States Alliance. It's great to be here. I uh, love having being on a webinar with Jason because I just get to learn for the first half of it. Uh, unfortunately, now in the second half, I have to follow that incredibly informative presentation and, and uh, try to, I, I guess my challenge as a moderator, as a presenter is to say, as Jason said, as few times as possible. So my over under on that is around 10. Uh, somebody keep me honest and keep track. Uh, as Jason did a great job going through all of the details of FERC 41 next steps, things like that, um, I thought I'd come here and, you know, do a little bit of the, the harmony for that, which is what is the industry's impression of this? What does this mean for the energy storage industry? Uh, and what is going to be the potential fallout uh, from good nail from FERC Order 841? Uh, so with that, I'll dive in and sort of get an impression of what the industry is looking like. Um, again, my name is Dan Finfoli from Wood McKenzie Power and Renewables. A uh, quick introductory slide on us here. I'll just pass through this really quickly. We're an energy consultancy group. Uh, my team lives within, the energy storage team lives within the power and renewables sphere, uh, but we have a great opportunity to sort of intersect with all these other areas, which of course you're going to see coming up in the slides ahead. What the industry is looking at now uh, is basically the entire U.S. The energy storage market is truly a national market. Uh, we have all the ISOs that are now going to be FERC 841 compliant, we hope, and that will open up a lot of opportunities. There's, of course, a lot of energy storage already operating in these regions and in wholesale markets. You know, FERC 841 in some markets didn't really start from scratch. So we had a lot of ancillary services in PJM, um, you know, and projects participating in other markets as well. But then even in these regulated areas, uh, the southeast, we have huge projects in Florida, investment in the Carolinas. Uh, out to Colorado, Nevada, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, tons of energy storage, solar plus storage, et cetera. But FERC 841 is really a game changer for a vast and I believe the majority of the country. Um, a couple of the areas that I wanted to highlight, we have policies and regulations that are intersecting with FERC 841 and wholesale market participation in general in really dynamic and interesting ways. What I wanted to highlight is uh, here in New England and Massachusetts, uh, the new Clean Peak standard requiring that load serving entities provide not just a percentage of their energy uh, as renewable energy as in the conventional renewable portfolio standard, but a growing percentage of their peak energy. Uh, there's a lot of great information from the Massachusetts DOER on this, but the um, their analysis says that based on the current structure of it, we could be looking at 1.6 gigawatts of energy storage. We saw from the Massachusetts um, state of charge report that getting a lot of the storage online has the potential to drive huge benefits to ratepayers. but so much, the majority of those benefits came from wholesale market participation, driving those costs down. So actually participating in that is a key segment of this Clean Peak standard that they're building towards. On the other side of the country in say California, you have the duck curve everybody has heard of, resource adequacy concerns. Uh, I believe in Southern California, they're looking at 2.6 gigawatts of need over the next couple of years. Large portion of that will be energy storage as well. Um, but again, a lot of participation already in California market for energy ancillary services. We see, you know, that market's being driven by a lot of solar penetration. Wind penetration in MISO and SPP is going to be going up. Uh, Texas as well, that's going to be creating effects in the wholesale markets in those regions. Uh, from there, we have signs of actual aggregation. Uh, DER aggregation, Sunrun in ISO New England's wholesale market, really exciting. Uh, and then I'd say New York ISO is one of those key bellwether uh, state markets to look at. They have a lot of incentives that require energy storage participation in wholesale markets. Um, by driving these things with these kinds of incentives, Massachusetts as well, California, uh, you could really start seeing what are the opportunities for energy storage to you know, to actually participate and drive these markets. As costs decline across the rest of the U.S., you're going to be seeing what you saw in, say, uh, New York or Massachusetts, maybe Hawaii, California, uh, expanding uh, across the other regions. Um, one last note I wanted to mention is what about Texas? But as Jason mentioned, that's number one at least, um, you know, this is its own unique place. But we're also seeing here, even without FERC 841 compliance, there's tons of interest in Texas from developers. Uh, solar plus storage, standalone storage, looking at uh, entering the wholesale markets there. Even though it's a bit of a clumsy method of doing so, the economics make sense. And that's what's driving things right now. 
Looking at interest graphically, you can see that our total pipeline we track as part of the energy storage service has surged uh, by over 3x from Q2 2018 to Q2 2019. Uh, and 67% between Q1 2019 and Q2 2019. This is a combination of interconnection queue requests, utility filings, uh, announcements, and pretty much every data source you can scrape. Uh, putting together, this is a, you know, a speculative pipeline, only a fraction of these will be built. But you can see that there's massive interest, and particularly in ISO regions, uh, ERCOT, PJM, California, New England, New York, uh, even in SPP and MISO, you can see this all others category, which contains a lot of that uh, surging in there. A lot of it is in deregulated markets. Um, uh, Colorado's a big one as well. I should mention our Energy Storage Summit uh, will be happening there December, um, the first week of December, right after the compliance deadline for 841. So we'll be having a panel on that. Make sure you can register for that now. But you can see the interest here is, is absolutely surging. And the diversity of the areas where the interest is based is also growing. It used to mostly just be a California market based on the incentive structure there, the mandate that they're looking at. Uh, now we're seeing all these other markets really slicing out uh, their own share of this increasingly large pie. This is showing that there's massive developer interest to dive into this market. To get us a little bit of the driver of that, I love taking data and seeing how you can sort of visualize how this effect is going to happen. Uh, this is a map of an ISO showing a year's worth of data, I believe it's 2017, looking at the negative price signals. Uh, so to yourself, just try to guess what ISO this is. This shows you the hour of the day and, and how many negative price signals there were. And you can start seeing something interesting in this data. This is, in fact, California ISO. Uh, across the various zones, we saw negative price signals spike during midday when you have lots of solar production. We are seeing increased renewable penetration in these markets. We see the fingerprints of that in this wholesale market data, which I just find super exciting. This is only going to increase as we get more renewables on the grid. And now we have 100% cleaner renewable energy goals in state markets across the U.S., uh, even as the federal government sort of lags behind on these kinds of goals, the states are taking up the mantle. So you're going to be seeing more of these effects within wholesale markets. Uh, if you guessed KISO, you're uh, not eliminated, you're not out of the woods yet. Here's a second ISO showing negative price signals, obviously a very different pattern here. Uh, make a quick note of where you think this is. And I want to get through lots of time, so I'm not going to give you that long. Uh, Southwest Power Pool, completely different um, signal pattern here, right? Very few negative price signals during the day. I uh, remember Kaiso had a, this big spike, uh, this big spike during the solar uh, period when solar power is high. In SPP, we have when demand is low and wind energy output is high during the evening hours. That means that we have negative price signals driven by wind energy. These patterns are going to be great. I mean, you know, energy storage loves seeing negative price signals. But as we get more and more renewables onto this grid, this opportunity is only going to grow. I think that's what a lot of the developers you see in the interconnection queue requests looking at Texas are looking at right now. What does this mean for the market? We saw that pipeline. Here's how that translates into our actual forecast over the next five years for megawatts of energy storage in the U.S. We're going to be seeing a pretty significant jump in 2020. But then in 2021, we're going to see a massive jump up. This is due to a lot of projects that are being procured through utilities, through master procurements, California, um, Hawaii, other regions as well. Um, stay safe for a little bit and then jumps again. A big chunk of this is going to be driven by economics in wholesale markets. There's a lot of uncertainty. How are uh, arbitrage price spreads going to compare? Uh, will energy frequency regulation markets get saturated as they did in PJM? You know, it's a small opportunity. What will happen to capacity market prices? But we already see massive amounts of speculation and projects going in the ground to drive out these deployments moving forward. So it's going to be a significant market. Uh, putting that in megawatt hour terms, projects are also going to be getting longer. We're inching towards um, four hour duration on average for front of the meter systems to meet those uh, uh, four hour duration requirements that uh, Jason mentioned again. That's at least two that I've caught myself, probably four or five that I've done total. Um, we're going to see a lot of those projects meeting the expectations set out by the ISOs in response to per quarter 841, providing massive amounts of load shifting and um, renewables shifting in these markets. So expect the projects to get a little bit longer duration as well. I wanted to call out the standalone storage ITC just because there's a really big opportunity in these wholesale markets. Jason mentioned the uh, problem of dual, uh, not dual participation, but uh, hybrid participation 
in these markets. Being able to install a standalone system may be a little bit easier. And if we have the standalone storage ITC, we actually see a 16% increase in the megawatts that we would see deployed. Uh, some of it through, you know, direct procurements or things like that, but a lot of it in these wholesale markets, building a quick battery energy storage system, taking advantage of some arbitrage and capacity opportunities while potentially doing some other things with the battery as well. And then finally, of course, everybody wants to see what it is in dollar value. So what we see moving forward is that we're going to hit the 5 billion mark in the U.S. market by 2024. Uh, I haven't shown you just the front of the meter portion here, the behind the meter as well, because this really is, as Jason mentioned, going to be a, a boon for the front of the meter and the behind the meter spaces, whether it's through aggregation or 100 kilowatt plus systems directly participating in these markets. This is going to open up or clarify and codify a tremendous amount of value for the energy storage market. Um, so with that, I will pause there. Happy to answer lots of questions. And there's lots more information about this as part of our energy storage service and, of course, our energy storage monitor. Uh, happy to discuss that with anyone else on the call who's interested as well. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks to both of you, and thanks for leaving plenty of time for questions. I'll start with a very simple one. What is self-management of state of charge, and what's the importance of it? Sure. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, no. Um, <clears throat> so as I noted, uh, one of the directives of Order 841 uh, has to concern state of charge management. This is the idea that as an energy storage unit, you only have so much uh, energy in your resource and you have to manage that limited energy in very sophisticated ways to maximize the value of it. So a state of charge might be 100%, which generally means full charge, and 0% means no charge, and somewhere in between. And the, 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 the thing that asset managers really seek is as much as possible to have the operational latitude to make decisions about how that state of charge is managed over time. And so that idea that you as the asset manager would make those decisions would be self-management of state of charge. And the eight, Order 841 gives folks generally that sort of right to manage their own state of charge. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't necessarily desire to have different ways in which state of charge of your asset can be automatically managed. So, for example, with very high speed, uh, you know, uh, services like, say, frequency regulation, you don't want to make a decision every two seconds about how to dispatch the asset. You would have it, for example, uh, potentially be responding to a signal. But even then, there's an option between, for example, turning over sort of management of the state of charge to the unit versus creating boundaries in your software that manages the asset for exactly, for example, how low or how high in your state of charge you're going to go. That's important for a couple of reasons. As I mentioned, it's about a maximization uh, decision in terms of how to charge and discharge to maximize the value of the unit in not just this interval, but in future intervals, since you're always looking ahead. And then secondarily, to manage the health of your storage unit. There are reasons why you might want to avoid getting very low or very high state of charge, uh, since that can have certain degradation issues for energy storage units. So, uh, Todd, does that get at your question? Yeah, I think so. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead to the next question. Actually, several questions um, are asking for information regarding uh, aggregated behind the meter storage or aggregated distrib distributed storage, as we're starting to see in in New England in particular. There's a lot of interest in um, aggregating small distributed storage, often uh, residential, and uh, we've seen even uh, Sunrun sell aggregated storage into the capacity market. We're seeing utilities start to uh, assemble virtual peakers, which are composed of many um, aggregated cu customer-sided batteries. Can you speak to how that plays uh well first any any sort of 
uh, observations about that. And then uh, how is that playing in the markets, in the, in the ISO markets? Is that just basically demand response or does it have the potential to play in other, um, uh, other markets in, within the ISOs and RTOs? Sure. No, it's a great, great question. And, you know, I think the development of these kind of VPP models is really exciting. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of companies out there, many of them ESA members, who are working tirelessly to prove out this business model that you can have a bunch of distributed storage resources that can act as sort of a cohesive whole. Um, without getting into the technical details of that, I will note that, yeah, we have two sort of major instances of this in ISO markets. The first, as you referenced, uh, Sunrun had a 20 megawatt uh, residential solar plus storage aggregation clear the forward capacity market in ISO New England. And then in Cal ISO, uh, you've seen aggregations of, again, behind the meter energy storage operating in, uh, I believe, generally in, in energy markets there, but uh, providing oftentimes relief from peak uh, periods of stress and demand on the electric system. And the important thing to understand here is that these assets are participating, as you hinted, as demand response resources, right? So in ISO New England, they're participating as passive demand resources. In Cal ISO, they're participating as proxy demand resources. So that means these storage units are load modifying for providing that service. Well, and, and that's happening in part because the market participation of demand response resources has kind of been trodden for, you know, well over, uh, you know, the last decade. And so that is the more immediate market participation opportunity for folks who are trying to aggregate these assets. There's nothing that prohibits you from modifying load in this kind of aggregated way. We've had aggregators of demand response for many years. The difference would be if those distributed energy storage units started injecting onto the grid, right? And Order 841 envisions this and would require any say behind the meter storage unit that injects onto the electric system for wholesale service to register not as demand response, but as a energy storage resource. Under that model, we haven't seen anyone develop uh, yet any sort of energy storage assets that I'm familiar with, uh, and let alone the aggregation question, which I think is very different once you're sending electrons onto the system. This is obviously part of the pending rulemaking at FERC on DER aggregations, and each of the RTOs and ISOs is taking this on differently, where you're seeing New York ISO and I think Cal ISO probably being more, most proactive insofar as those single state ISOs are also pursuing uh, a models where you're going to have more sort of integration between distributed resources and bulk system services. Um, but, you know, I'm also optimistic that over time there will be, in places like ISO New England and elsewhere, a greater sense of the value of having those kinds of resources being injecting and not simply load modifying. Okay, thank you. And uh, Dan, feel free to jump in if you have uh, additional comments or observations. Yeah, as, as Jason said, <laughs> no, it, it really is. Uh, the industry wants this sort of direct participation. Uh, the demand response load modifying system uh, works, and you can get the economics going. But I think that th there is this door opening when you can actually have an aggregate group of systems directly participating, recognized for what they are, instead of just this mysterious behind the scenes load modifying entity. Uh, I think that that getting that aggregation is is a pretty clear next step for the behind the meter industry. Great. Okay, we have somebody who's asking about capacity rights for residential solar and storage systems, um, particularly where the storage is being charged by the PV. And I know this has come up. There was a docket in Massachusetts. I believe there was a docket in California, uh, maybe in New York. Um, capacity rights for the storage, which is, um, I think, uh, 
starting to be looked at differently than capacity rights for the solar, especially where you have a net metering system. The solar is often kind of defaults, the capacity right defaults to the to the utility, um, not necessarily so the storage. Can you can you speak to that issue? Yeah, sure. And I think Massachusetts DPU had uh, some a twin set of rulings on precisely this issue, which is what directly led to I think that uh, 20 megawatt solar storage aggregation bidding and clearing the capacity market, which was that Massachusetts DPU clarified that the capacity rights for that storage, basically the the asset owner could effectively I believe buy out the uh, the distribution utility uh, with respect to those capacity rights. For solar, right, the capacity rights were inherent uh, were meant to adhere with the distribution utility, and frankly, it wasn't that big of a deal because the value of solar assets is their energy, not necessarily their capacity, since they're non-dispatchable assets. It's the opposite with storage, right? Storage is limited energy. It's not how many kilowatt hours you get out of it. It's about exactly when you want to use it for maximum value. And so given that the capacity value is the greater part of the value of that asset, I think Massachusetts DPU rightfully understood that the regimen for these assets, which would either be participating in retail programs uh, like net energy metering or SMART, uh, you should still have some way to make sure that that capacity value can stay with the asset owner if they desire it to do so. I believe that's the framework that's in place there. Um, but you know, this is this is a question that I think you're going to see each state kind of take on. And while we think Massachusetts certainly has provided a path forward, that does not necessarily mean that that's how everyone's going to take it on. Okay. Thank you. Um, somebody was asking about the ITC, uh, slightly off topic, but apparently there was uh, some, the, the questioner referring to one of the slides um, from Woods McKenzie that showed ESS standalone ITC and wants to know if that's a thing or, or not. As I understand it, not yet, but there's a a uh, bill working its way through the Senate that would provide some kind of federal tax credit for standalone storage. Is there? Do you guys have any further information about that? Yeah, so that's based on a couple of different um, looks that the federal government has been looking at a standalone storage ITC. Uh, Jason, of course, can say a bit more about it. Just saying about uh, explaining my assumptions there for that, that was a model that would that was examining if there were a standalone ITC, uh, and the economics were looked at from a couple months ago, so very little chance that it will actually be affecting 2019 numbers now. Uh, if there was an ITC that was standalone, how much would it affect the storage market? Uh, and it's, uh, as far as I'm aware, I think the, the BEST Act actually just moved forward a little bit recently from uh, the Senate. Um, if, if Jason, I'm sure if you had your way, that thing would be passed and ready to go already. Yeah, um, and the key thing folks should just bear in mind here is that, you know, ITC eligibility uh, for storage already exists if it is integrated into a solar asset, right, as per administrative guidance and private letter rulings from the IRS. So that is something that I think will keep uh, storage moving, but we are, of course, here at ESA seeking to ensure that all storage paired with whatever it wants to be paired with, and all storage technologies are eligible on their own stand. So that's the bicameral, bipartisan legislation that we are promoting this year in the House and in the Senate. That's okay. a good note as, as well, because it's um, the analysis states that it's only about 16%, which may seem a little bit low, but that's just because so much of what we're going to see deployed over the next five years is already solar paired and thus eligible for the ITC already. Okay. Great. Um, so here's a here's a, a backup and and put things in context or put things in perspective type of question. Um, in your view, how important is 841 to the overall future of storage? Given that much storage activity is going on outside of ISO/RTO jurisdiction, 
and that significant ISO RTO acceptance of storage was already occurring without regard to 841. And I'll just add, um, taking into account the many state policy initiatives around storage, procurement goal targets and mandates around storage, um, the dropping storage pricing, um, sort of sort of expansion mm. of the markets even out even before 841. What's you know how where where does 841 fit in in terms of moving the needle and it, you know are are storage providers suddenly getting access to new markets because of it or are we still waiting to find out? Yeah, Todd, you, you, you go ahead, Jason. No, oh, Dan, I talk too much. You go ahead. Never, Jason, promise. Um, it, it really is, you, you bring up a lot of good points. To me, um, the era of storage is, is already emerging. Uh, FERC 841 is just accelerating it. You know, the, the cost declines for uh, particularly lithium ion systems, and then as we look into the next generation of energy storage, no matter what it may be, as well as all these energy storage mandates, 100% renewable targets, all these things are having domino effects through every element of the energy supply chain, whether it's a residential customer deciding to build a battery, a uh, utility looking at their integrated resource planning over the next 20 years, or even just an RFP over the next two years. This is something that is, the price declines and costs are really driving this market. Uh, what FERC 841 is doing is making sure that all those markets are being nudged in the same direction, reducing complexity, ensuring eligibility. These are all things that are you know, going to be catalysts into this already ongoing reaction. I would say that it's going to accelerate it. And when you're this early in a market, in, in a developing market, you saw the slides that I showed showing you know, limited deployments last year, this year, um, but then scaling up so quickly, a small nudge in this direction builds out expertise in the market, builds out scale, uh, helps familiarize players with this technology. And that can have real significant effects as we start looking at the storage market ramping up exponentially. So I would say that it's not going to make or break the market, but it is going to be a very large factor in how quickly the market scales up. And um, from my standpoint, I'll just add it's a necessary, uh, even if not sufficient, condition for development in the markets. You, we're not going to be able to finance and get much in the way of storage assets into these markets without clarity on rules. Folks want to make sure they understand actually what they're going to be able to do. And that was a key part of 841 for the business and investment community is making clear this is how your storage assets can participate. Now, uh, I do think, and you know, to take the questioner's direction, you know, a lot of the action has been outside of organized wholesale markets. And the question is, why is that the case? And it's not necessarily just in places like, say, New York or California that have, uh, you know, exciting public state public policies. You've seen this happen in places like Arizona, uh, Nevada. Um, you know, Hawaii, other places. And the question you should all be thinking about is, why is that happening? The answer in many respects is because you have the access to a long-term contract for your capacity in a way that does not necessarily exist presently in the RTO and ISO markets. And that's really critical because storage assets are more or less fixed cost assets. That is to say, they do not have much in the way of variable costs. And so most of the money comes up front, and then you are amortizing the benefits over the lifetime of the asset. That's a different risk profile than assets that run on, say, fuel, so have a variable cost driver, and that you can kind of pay as you go, which markets are very well suited towards. They are based around marginal cost dispatch on fuel. And a lot of the things about market design are fuel driven. And so I think that that is really going to be a key differentiator. We are seeing folks on the RTO and ISO market side, obviously thinking more creatively about market design and trying to move away from systems that are biased towards fuel-based resources and accommodating sort of the constraints and characteristics of fuel-based resources. Obviously, this discussion of capacity markets and capacity value is, I think, very front and center in my mind when it comes to that discussion. But 
you know, a lot of the work that's driving storage now is really sort of long-term planning, like integrated resource planning that you're seeing in more of these vertically integrated markets. And that's going to, I would say, at least in the near term, still drive a lot more of the storage that we're going to see because of that contracting capability, because of the nature of needing to identify the need uh, and therefore be able to just get regulatory approval to contract for it. Actually, one thing I should note, Todd, if it's all right, is that uh, ESA is in fact holding seminars on including storage in integrated resource planning and other long-term uh, utility planning, uh, both in November and December. We have dates in Atlanta and Min in Minnesota uh, to help guide folks through how to add storage into long-term planning. So please be in touch if that's of interest. Okay, great. And we're going to have to uh, make that the last question because we are out of time. We've gone a little over. So I'm going to thank our presenters and turn this over to Maria, who will tell you how to access the webinar archive and will also tell you about an upcoming webinar of interest. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks again to our guest speakers and to all our participants on the webinar today. Um, you can see on your screen there's an upcoming webinar that we're hosting on October 10th, replacing power plants with low-income residential solar and storage. Uh, there's a link here that will provide you access to the registration page for that webinar and also uh, the webinar page for this webinar. Within 48 hours, I'll be pulling together an email for all of our participants today that will link you to the webinar recording and the webinar material, so be on the lookout for that. And we hope you enjoyed today's event, and we look forward to having your partic participation in our next webinar. Have a great day, everyone, and thanks again to Jason Berwin and to Dan Finfoley. Have a great day. <laughs>